We'll talk about Williams syndrome in this lecture. So we're going to go over a brief overview. We'll talk about the molecular genetics behind uh, Williams syndrome, uh, which aren't fully understood at this point. We'll go over some of the features. Primarily, we're going to be looking at the facial features, but there are lots of comorbidities or, uh, or accompanying features in other organ systems that can come with this, and it's worth knowing those as well. Uh, we'll talk about how these children develop, uh, any problems that can get in the way, uh, how we diagnose these patients when we have clinical suspicion, and then our immediate and long-term management, as well as uh, some final considerations. So we'll put you in a park right now. So imagine you're in a park and a child comes running up to you. You've never seen her before. You've never met her but she displays a familiar friendliness as if she's known you all of her life. She looks like she's only about all of three years old, but she has an amazing way with words that adds to her engaging personality. It's not obvious at first, but when you take a closer look at her, you notice distinctive physical traits. So you look at this little girl, and you might notice a few things, perhaps. A bit of a longer philthrum here, and a very low nasal bridge, and also these eyes. Look at these very, very, very almost mesmerizing eyes. She's got light blue eyes, but you can see if you looked at really close that she's got a stellate pattern, a star pattern to her eyes, and this is unusual. Uh, also, you can note the uh, prominent forehead and perhaps a, uh, a small borderline small uh, chin. And these are all characteristic facial features of a patient with Williams syndrome. So Williams syndrome is a genetic condition that involves a distinct facial appearance. Also can involve some medical issues including idiopathic hypercalcemia which will usually uh, present early on in life uh, in the newborn neonatal period. However it can stick with a patient throughout their lives and uh, continue to be a, uh, an issue. Uh, there's also an association with cardiovascular uh, abnormalities and this is what we're most concerned of when we're thinking about Williams syndrome in adult medicine. Uh, it's that these patients have a uh, predilection for developing supraventricular aortic stenosis. Uh, they also have a characteristic neurodevelopmental and behavioral profile, which is very unique, even unique in uh, comparison to some of these other genetic syndromes that affect neurodevelopment. Like all syndromes, the phenotypic expression can vary greatly, and so no one patient is the exact same as the next, but there are some, uh, there are some features that are pretty well preserved from one Williams syndrome patient to the next. The incidence is anywhere between 1 in 7,500 to 1 in 25,000. Um, though, though that's the range of literature that I've seen, but uh, most of the literature has it uh, right in the middle uh, of this range. All right, so uh, the genetics. Um, Williams syndrome is involved with a defect. Usually it's a deletion of the long arm of chromosome 7, and that deletion can be of various lengths. This region codes for about 25 different genes. And remember, we have about 20,000 genes in our body, so 25 genes isn't a whole lot. Uh, all of these genes can be implicated in the syndrome, uh, but... Uh, you can imagine how you can get Williams syndrome of varying, uh, varying presentations and varying severities um, based on how much of this uh, of this region that tends to be deleted, how much of it really is deleted. The most well-known gene that's affected and that truly is affected in almost all cases of Williams syndrome is a gene known as ELN. And this is a gene that codes for a protein that goes into elastin. Uh, the defect that involves ELN is probably the attributing factor for those cardiovascular issues and connective tissue pathology that's seen in these patients. And there's other genes that are under investigation uh, for their role in the characteristic facial features as well as the cognitive profile. 
hypercalcemia, glucose metabolism, and hypertension, all of which we see uh, defects of in patients with Williams syndrome to one degree or another. Williams syndrome is typically acquired sporadically, like a lot of these genetic disorders, independent of the genetics of the parents. However, there are rare exceptions. There's a particular gene that if it's inverted in families, uh, you can get uh, a higher likelihood of transmitting Williams syndrome onto uh, the offspring. That's unusual, but uh, you can read up on that if you want. Um, I can't remember what the, I think the gene is called WBSCR. So you can look that up if you want. Uh, also, Williams syndrome patients are, uh, while they do have uh, intellectual handicapped, they don't tend to be very intellectually handicapped, and generally not to the point where it's going to be prohibitive on them forming uh, personal relationships. And thus, uh, because they're not sterile, they can produce offspring. And so. Uh, it is certainly possible that a patient can uh, have Williams syndrome because their parent had Williams syndrome. But in those cases, it's typically very easy to diagnose, but it does happen. Now, I want to introduce you to a genetic term called haploinsufficiency. And uh, what haploinsufficiency means is that, all right, we have two genes. We have two sets of chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, and they're both important in producing protein, producing something uh, that is geared towards an end, towards a goal. And if you lose one of them, then you're going to wind up with a defect. And when you have haploinsufficiency, it's just that. You lose one gene, and now you have a defect because you don't have enough genetic material to lead to a, common, a normal phenotype. Okay, so with Williams syndrome, the loss of function of just one gene, one, one, uh, uh, just enough uh, genetic material on the 7Q1123 region, uh, that leads to haploinsufficiency. And so despite the fact that you may have a normal complementary chromosome, you're not going to have enough genetic material, uh, and that's going to lead to a normal phenotype. This sounds just like autosomal dominant disorders, and that's indeed how Williams syndrome would be transmitted if it were transmitted familially. Um, now, on the other hand, you could compare that to something like cystic fibrosis, where you could have one cystic fibrosis gene, but as long as the other gene is working properly, you will not have cystic fibrosis. So that would be uh, the opposite end of the spectrum. Here, if you have one gene that is off, then you're going to have an abnormal phenotype. All right, there are a lot of features of Williams syndrome, and certainly not all patients are going to have all of these symptoms, all of these features, but some of these are important to know. And so I would know all of these general features. So they tend to be small uh, babies. So there's prenatal, postnatal growth delay. Uh, if Williams syndrome is not diagnosed, if this mis may be misdiagnosed on the growth chart as a failure to thrive. About a third of these babies will have microcephaly. Uh, they also tend to have early feeding difficulties that can contribute to what may look like a failure to thrive, although you may get real organic failure to thrive in that case. Uh, they tend to be hypotonic, and then they also tend to be small uh, lengthwise. Their face. All right. There are a lot of different things with their face, and certainly, again, not all Williams syndrome patients are going to have all of these features. But uh, this, this is these facial features are conserved with Williams patients. You're not going to run into a Williams syndrome patient who doesn't have some of these uh, characteristic features. Uh, so, all right, mild to moderate MR. Uh, that's not a facial feature. I, I don't know why I put it put that in there. Uh, so anyway, going down here, low nasal bridge. So a nasal bridge is pretty much the bridge that connects one side of your face to the next across your nose. So that bridge is going to be low, and as a result of that, you're going to have a sh very short upturned nose. I'll show you some pictures. A long philthrum. So that philthrum is that little area that's depressed right above your lip. And so that's going to be long in the, uh, it's in, in the vertical direction. So there's going to be a distance, a longer distance, between where their nose ends and where their lip, their upper lip begins. 
These patients also tend to have wider mouths and as a consequence, widely spaced teeth and excess gingival tissue. Not exactly sure what's behind the excess gingival tissue, but I'll show you some pictures of some uh, Williams syndrome people and you can see, um, particularly in adults, that they do have excess gingival tissue. Uh, full lips, particularly their lower lip, will be uh, accentuated. They tend to have smaller chins. If you look at their eyes, usually you'll see some fullness around the eyes. And then patients who have bluish or greenish colored eyes, you'll note in their iris that it has this very lacy and stellate pattern. And this is very easy to pick up on uh, once you see a few pictures of it. Going towards the uh, organic systems, cardiovascular, uh, we mentioned the superva supervalvular aortic stenosis. That's a common problem in Williams syndrome patients, and uh, this is something that needs to be addressed immediately. Uh, hypertension is something that uh, is another risk, uh, particularly because these patients have uh, a tendency to develop renal artery stenosis. And so we're constantly checking on this. You want to make sure that you're checking the blood pressure in both arms because of the possibility of something going wrong with the aorta. Uh, but if there ever is hypertension, you're going to want to treat that immediately. Other features that can show up include pulmonary stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Endocrine. So there's an idiopathic hypercalcemia. We don't know why this happens. We're still studying the genes to determine how this happens. But we do know that this hypercalcemia can be particularly problematic uh, during infancy. Most patients outgrow it, for lack of a better word, but then uh, you will have some patients who struggle with this throughout their lives, and we'll talk about how we can manage that. A lot of these patients will have a subclinical hypothyroidism, although some patients may have symptoms related to the hypothyroidism. A lot of these patients will go on to develop to, de to develop type 2 diabetes, and again, there is a gene on chromosome 7 that is, uh, that is in this area that's involved in glucose metabolism, and so it probably has something to do with that, but these patients uh, are at risk for going into developing type 2 diabetes. And a minority of Williams syndrome patients will develop precocious puberty, and of course, if that happens, then you need to send these children off to a pediatric endocrinologist. Musculoskeletal, uh, we have joint hypermobility usually with these children. This will decline with age and ultimately they can wind up with joint contractures. So you'll go from one end of the spectrum to the other. Uh, these patients also uh, have a predilection towards kyphoscoliosis and lordosis. If you look at their skin, if you feel their skin, it tends to be soft and lax, not to the point of somebody with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but they have a certain laxity of their skin. And again, this goes back to the fact that the main mutation here is, uh, is with the elastin gene. And then uh, nail uh, hyper, actually I meant to put hypoplasia. That should be nail hypoplasia with an O. So their nails don't develop properly. Okay, uh, special senses. So this is another big one here, uh, hyperacuity. So when you are dealing with very young children with Williams syndrome, noises are going to kind of freak them out a little bit. And that just has to do with the fact that for some reason their brain has developed to be very sensitive in the auditory cortex. And that's what's going to ultimately give rise to their affinity towards music and their accept. This hyperacuity, though, is something that a lot of times parents will deal with with their young children uh, because kids will go in, they'll tr cover their ears and say, oh, that's too loud, that's too loud. And there's things such as music therapy that can help you get beyond this, but this is a common feature early on. Uh, sensory neural hearing loss can develop uh, later on in life, uh, and that's probably due to the fact that they are at risk for these serious otitis media episodes, which should be addressed. Uh, as far as their eyes, they're more likely to, to develop esotropia, which can lead to strabismus, uh, and they also are at risk for refractory errors, too, but those are pretty nonspecific signs. Remember that stellate iris pattern, which is much easier to see in lighter uh, irises, and then they are also at risk for cataracts. GI, uh, they can have chronic abdominal pain. That can be due to multiple different things. They do have an 
increased incidence of celiac disease, which can cause chronic abdominal pain. They also have an increased risk of uh, colonic diverticulosis. And the reason for that is, again, it's a connective tissue uh, issue related to their elastin. All right, so getting what's to what's a little bit more important here, their uh, development. Uh, so they tend to be in the mild to moderate mental retardation or intellectual handicap uh, range, but you have a wide range here. So where you do have some Williams syndrome patients who are uh, more severe or profound intellectual handicap, and you have some Williams syndrome patients who are in the normal IQ range. Early on, these children will have delayed motor development, which ultimately should catch up with time. Delayed language acquisition, which should also catch up with time, and some would say uh, even more. Uh, difficulties with visual spatial tasks. So if you ask these kids to put together a puzzle, they're going to have major difficulty with that. If you put a picture, like a, just a drawing of a house, and ask them to to to, to replicate that and draw it themselves, they're going to have difficulty with that too. Uh, some of these children will also have gait apraxia, and you'll notice that this is even worse if they're on uh, something like sand or grass as opposed to on carpet or uh, hardwood floor. Psychiatrically, this is associated with a high rate of emotional and behavioral problems, anxieties, preoccupations, OCD-like characteristics, panic, phobias, depression. About 25% of these children will show features that are consistent with autism spectrum disorder. It's been classically described that these children have a friendly social demeanor, and that is true in many cases, but certainly not all cases. But what is true in about 100% of patients with Williams syndrome is that they have an affinity towards music. At the very least, music is soothing to them. At least once they get out of that hyperacuity stage, um, these children really, really love music. Um, and this has also led to uh, a savantism in some patients. So um, that's something that we don't really understand yet, uh, why that happens, but it does. So here's some of those facial features. This adorable child has all of your major facial features of Williams syndrome. Uh, so he's got a, uh, well, this sunken nasal bridge isn't really, can't really see that it's pointing to it, but yes, he does have the sunken nasal bridge. And uh, as a result of that, uh, you can see more of his uh, inside of his nares. Uh, this kid would be good with a nasoscope. Uh, so there's a little bit of puffiness around the eyes, kind of hard to see with the light on this. Um, He's got blue eyes with a starry pattern. I'm going to show you a better picture of what that looks like. He's got a long uh, upper lip length, sort of that that ear to ear smile, uh, and then the widely spaced teeth, and uh, then a uh, wide mouth, a prominent lower lip, and a small chin. So here's a baby with Williams syndrome. What you notice most prominently is the uh, the the taller philthrum here increased distance from uh, from the tip of the nose to the lip, and then very, very, very low nasal bridge. A little bit of puffiness around the eyes, too, especially right up here. Okay, so this young man, you clearly see the stellate pattern of the eyes. You can almost make out a star-like shape. You know, very, very, very beautiful eyes. Um, so that's another thing that we don't really know why that happens, but uh, this is a common feature that's seen. Now here you don't see so much of a sunken nasal bridge, but you do see a very, very, very long philthrum. And uh, maybe a little bit of puffiness around the eyes. You can't really make out much of the forehead because his hair is in the way. Uh, but he also, this kid also does have a very wide grin. So uh, this child uh, also has those very, very uh, alluring eyes. Uh, see the, uh, the, the stellate pattern, pigmentation pattern. Um, his uh, nasal bridge is a little less prominent, uh, so you don't see that feature so much. You do see a little bit of puffiness around the eyes, um, definitely a smaller chin. 
and look at that grin. It's going from one side to the other. So uh, you can see comparing these patients that they don't all have all of the features of uh, Williams syndrome facies, but uh, they all have some. Okay, so this is our little girl in the park. Look at these eyes. So this is that stellate pattern of the iris. You can see she's got a sunken nasal bridge, slightly longer philthrum, small jaw. If you were to have her grin, you probably see small teeth that are widely spaced apart. Just like in this little girl here. So again, you see blue eyes here. You can't really get a good view of that stellate pattern. You see some puffiness, particularly around her right eye. And then her nasal bridge is a little bit higher up than those other uh, patients. But you definitely see the gaps in between the teeth, smaller teeth, stellate pattern, puffiness around the eyes. So all of these things you have to put into context with the patient. You can't diagnose a patient's syndrome just based on looking at their face, um, with the exception of maybe a few things like PRL band sequence and stuff, but we're not talking about that. Um, okay, now this is an adult with Williams syndrome, and uh, this is actually a particularly famous adult. Um, but uh, she is, uh, her name is Gabrielle Marianne Rivard, and uh, she is actually in a movie uh, that uh, I don't know if it was her life story, uh, but um, anyhow, the movie was named after her. Uh, but she uh, is a Canadian actress, and she has Williams Syndrome, and this movie was about her joining a, uh, a uh, choir for special needs uh, people, and um, it was uh, it's about a two-hour movie. If you ever uh, come across this, it's worth watching. Uh, so you can see here, remember what I said about the gingival, uh, excess gingival tissue? You can definitely see it on her. Um, but again, you also see... Um, sort of the uh, sunken nasal bridge, longer philthrum, um, not too small of a jaw, but uh, you can see that there are some changes that happen as kids get older, the, some of those facial stigma uh, change. Uh, this is another uh, woman who is a musical savant. Um, her name is escaping me at the moment. Um, I'll be sure to include it in a little caption below here. Um, but anyhow, um, she is, uh, is a uh, performer, and she plays the accordion, and she's been to multiple different venues. And uh, uh, so this just goes to show you that, uh, that if these patients truly do have uh, increased musical abilities. Okay, so getting back to a little bit more of a... Uh, the organic medical end of things. Uh, so remember that one of the more uh, problemsome complications of Williams syndrome is supravalvular aortic stenosis. And this is what it would look like uh, if you were to do a contrast uh, study. So this is um, the uh, base of the aorta, and this is the, the constriction here, the, uh, the stenosis. And the normal aortic diameter, starting at the root of the aorta, in a male should be about 3.91 centimeters, in a female 3.72 centimeters, and you can go down that, um, but the overall trend is that the, uh, is that the, uh, the, it should get smaller gradually. What you see here is a very uh, significant narrowing here of the, uh, of the uh, aorta. So again, you see it here as well. All right. Um, so their development during childhood, uh, physically, their motor milestones will be delayed, but ultimately they'll be uh, attained. Uh, cognitively, there tends to be delayed language acquisition. Children with Williams syndrome will also struggle with visual spatial activities like drawing or writing or putting puzzles together. Uh, nevertheless, as these children get older, uh, they tend to have a particular strength in facial recognition, uh, which I guess is not part of visual spatial uh, domain, uh, but they, they tend to be really good with facial recognition, probably because they are very good at memorizing things, not necessarily using the things that they memorize, but memorizing them. And that 
explains why these people, as they get older, they tend to have a much higher vocabulary, and that's sort of going back to that girl in the park. Uh, they can develop a really, really, really uh, expanded uh, vocabulary that's years beyond what you would expect for their age. Now, does it mean they're going to always know when to use that word appropriately? No, but they can memorize uh, words to meanings. It doesn't mean they're always going to use it correctly, though, when they're talking. Uh, these children also, uh, characteristically, as mentioned, are drawn to music, and many find peace in gentle, soft music, especially when they're hyperacuic. Uh, but uh, many Williams patients have gone on to demonstrate musical savantism. Socially, a peculiar feature of Williams syndrome is that many of these children prefer to be in groups and prefer to be with other people, and they love to meet and talk to strangers. So that's another, uh, another thing that we don't really know why that happens, but there's this lack of inhibition around that. And so that brings up one red flag on a serious note that parents with these children still do need to counsel their kids about really should not talk to strangers unless mom and dad say it's okay, even if you want to. Uh, adolescence and adulthood, uh, intellectual disability can hinder progress in school, but remember it's a very wide range uh, when we're talking about intellectual capabilities here, and some Williams patients have gone on to complete high school and college degrees. Most Williams patients will be significantly below their expected adult height given their parents' heights. So in order to make a diagnosis, you can make a presumptive diagnosis on clinical features, but any patient who you suspect or presume to have Williams syndrome uh, deserves formal genetic testing. And the best genetic test to diagnose Williams syndrome is fluorescent in situ hybridization, particularly looking for that deletion uh, on uh, uh, 7Q1123. Management. Once you make the diagnosis, at least uh, even if it's just a clinical diagnosis while you're awaiting uh, the, uh, the, your, your results uh, from your genetic testing, uh, you can start with getting some baseline labs. So you want to get routine labs including serum calcium. You'll get a baseline urinalysis also including a urine calcium. You also want to get a baseline assessment of their thyroid function. Remember, some of these patients can be hypothyroid subclinically. And this is more so that you get a baseline idea of where they're at when they appear relatively healthy. So in case something goes wrong, then you have something to compare it to. Uh, you'll also want to uh, consult pediatric cardiology for a baseline echocardiogram and EKG because 50% of these children are going to have significant cardiac lesions on diagnosis and about 20 to 30% of those patients are going to go on to require some kind of surgery uh, for those cardiac lesions. Baseline renal sonography is also useful. Baseline audiometric testing because of the possibility of hearing loss. Uh, later on in life, and then referral to a clinical geneticist for further evaluation and genetic counseling. The long-term management uh, is going to be multidisciplinary. Uh, cardiovascularly, we're going to be concerned about their blood pressure. We want to make sure we measure the blood pressure in both arms uh, at every visit, because remember with aortic stenosis, you can stenose off the blood flow to one part of the one side of the body and not to the other side. So you want to make sure you're measuring it in both arms. And if there is indeed hypertension, it should be treated as soon as it's diagnosed. Hypercalcemia is noted in 15% of patients, though it's subclinical. Periodic evaluations of blood calcium is judicious. Patients should also be advised to avoid exceeding their re uh, re recommended daily amount of calcium and vitamin D. Uh, despite that, some patients may require bisphosphonates or corticosteroids for tighter control, especially if the patient develops a complication of hypercalcemia, such as nephrocalcinosis, long bone sclerosis, uh, or if normal calcium levels can't be attained by dietary restriction alone. Keep an eye out for symptoms of hypercalcemia that you would see in babies or infants, and that would be things like decreased feeding, irritability, uh, or colic. Cognitively, um, 
it's you know never easy to work with the public schools in the United States, but uh, try to get individualized educational plans uh, that can uh, focus on making the most out of their strengths and also focusing on uh, how we can best address their weaknesses. Uh, anticipatory guidance is useful for parents so they know kind of what to expect. Um, and that's also going to be useful, especially as these children get older, get, turn into adolescents, and naturally, because they're, in most cases, not too cognitively impaired, they're going to want independence to some degree, just like any other adolescent. But the problem is, with most of these patients, full independence is not always advisable. Um, so uh, it's important for parents to be aware um, that even though your child has Williams syndrome, they are in many other domains completely normal and they're going to want independence. Um, so you need to expect that. Uh, other things, lifelong follow-up with a cardiologist because of the risk for all of these cardiovascular morbidities. Routine audiometric testing, periodic thyroid function tests, music therapy, especially early on, is incredibly useful for getting rid of that uh, that photophobia, or not photophobia, phonophobia, or uh, uh, that um, increased sensitivity to sound. Uh, so you can help them there with that. Uh, physical therapy for older patients can help avoid joint contractures. Uh, Another thing, please note, uh, and this I'm just coming at this from a uh, clinical management perspective. If you ever have a patient with Williams syndrome, if you happen to be a surgical resident watching this or somebody going into surgery or going into anesthesiology for sure, Williams syndrome patients are at increased risk of anesthesia-related complications. And so because of that, it's really important that all surgeons and anesthesiologists who may be caring for the patient or performing surgery uh, that they're aware of this uh, of this diagnosis so that they can take appropriate precautions. And personally, I'm not exactly sure what an anesthesiologist is going to do differently for a patient with Williams syndrome, but it's very important they know because these patients are at risk, uh, higher risk for anesthesia-related complications. Long-term considerations, uh, medical complications mostly relate to the cardiovascular issues, and these complications are the ones that are most likely to shorten the lifespan of these patients. Patients with Williams syndrome are, uh, they do have a shorter lifespan, and it's generally due to cardiovascular issues. So if you can manage that, and if, you know, if the patient's got a really, really good uh, cardiologist, got a good, uh, good primary care team, then you can really make an effect on uh, lengthening the life of these patients. Most adults can perform self-care tasks, uh, but they do require, many of them do require daily assistance of parents or caregivers, particularly when we're talking about medical decisions, legal decisions, paying bills, uh, some of the more complex things that adults have to deal with. A small minority, though, are able to live independently. And then finally, Patients with Williams syndrome are fertile, so women who are considering pregnancy should be advised of their risk of giving birth to a child with Williams syndrome. It's about 50%. Uh, and if they do decide to go ahead with pregnancy, they should be referred to a uh, maternal fetal medicine practitioner uh, who can monitor them uh, because they, uh, most of them will have hypertension or be at risk for hypertension. Um, and then, of course, any of those cardiovascular complications that may come up, um, they should be monitored for that. And also, I should say, probably hypercalcemia, too, in some cases. Uh, it's subclinical in a lot of patients, but uh, uh, pregnancy can exacerbate any of these things that pre-exist. So uh, that's why you're going to want these women to be uh, in consult with maternal fetal medicine, not just a regular OBGYN uh, for their pregnancy and delivery. If you have any questions, go ahead and uh, let me know. Actually, I think I have another slide here. Oh, yes. So some of these pictures, of these really uh, beautiful pictures of these kids, um, I got these off of a website um, that is uh, um, putting out for a film on Williams Syndrome. They're advertising uh, this. You can buy it. Uh, it's $29.99 US, um, but I highly recommend it. Um, you can get a good idea of uh, sort of 
the uh, nature of these children, how they live their lives, what's done uh, for them, at least from a social perspective, to uh, sort of help them uh, uh, help them maintain friendships and uh, do their activities of daily life and you know, sort of give you uh, an insider view rather than what we normally get. When we're looking at patients, you know, we get the patients when they come into the clinic or in the hospital. But remember, you know, 99% of the time a person spends, they're not in the hospital. They're outside living daily life. And so this will give you a good view of what Williams syndrome looks like for these patients when they're outside in the world. And so I highly recommend this. I watched this myself and uh, it's fantastic. So uh, with that, go ahead and uh, write me any questions you have. Otherwise, I will see you next time.